Jason, your dad told me you and uh, he have launched a lot of rockets. Oh, well, we've launched quite a few, yeah. yeah. Well, I understand the scientific principle, but I certainly haven't been checked out in practical rocketry. <laughs> so what goes on with this one? Well, I'll start on the inside. Okay. First of all, this is the engine, mm -hmm. the brown part on the bottom. And what that is, is that's what actually propels the rocket. All right. And first of all, right down here on the bottom, like right on the inside here, is a clay nozzle. So, Which you don't want to burn. No, that yeah. won't burn. And what that does is that kind of directs the fire the actual stuff. Fire yeah, amp. right. In other words, you're going to burn this, and all this black, this stuff inside, which is now takes up this space, is now going to change to a gas, fire out through that clay part, right. and that makes the rocket go. Okay. Right. On top of the propellant, that's the stuff that that's makes it go That's the section right here, right? Right. Right in here mm -hmm. is called an ejection charge and that explodes and fires the parachute Upward, out. this way. Right. Ah, I see. That yellow thing is the parachute and they're right. all crumpled up? Okay. Yeah. Now right here you see some crumpled up kind of Kleenex type mm -hmm. stuff. That's called the recovery wadding. That's just to keep the parachute from melting because the ejection charge is very, very hot. Okay, so that's going to explode and fire and prevent the parachute from burning, but meanwhile the parachute goes out. Right. Then I notice here's a long wire and at the top here there's a little cap. Yeah. And well, the thing is sticking down. What's yeah, okay. that for? Well, first of all... Can I take it off for you? Sure. Okay. okay. This is called a protector cap. That's just to keep anybody from poking their eye on oh, the... I see. On the... And the little key there? Well, this is to start... Yeah. ...the launcher thing, right? So, you put the key in here, and it won't launch unless you have that key in there. I see. Safety then, precaution. Right. And then to launch it, you just push the button. Now, then there are some safety precautions, too, about actually firing. Right. Well, first of all, you should be launching in a big, clear field mm -hmm. with no trees or anything in it. Uh, have a deflector pad, because unless you're in a big dirt pit, because what will happen is the flames will just go straight down and burn the grass and I start see. a fire. Clear all people from the area, mm -hmm. because rockets aren't completely reliable, but they are pretty reliable. Mm -hmm. If your rocket doesn't go off, never go near it. Just wait a minute, three minutes, so on, because the rocket might be stalling or the igniter might be malfunctioning or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So you really have to be careful if How it about doesn't wind? go off. Yeah, you gotta launch on a calm day because the rocket will drift. And also, it's good to have some trackers to stand at fixed positions and watch the rocket because it, rockets really get lost easily if they okay, drift. Okay, well this one's going to how far? Well, well, there's different kinds of engines, mm -hmm. A, B, C, and Ds. This is an A, A, 8, 4. Yeah. Now, the 8 in there stands for an 8-second delay. Oh, I see. So what, it, what it's going to do is this A engine is one of the weakest. Okay. So it's only going to launch at maybe 200, 300 feet at the maximum 400. Okay, you're ready to go? Ready to go. All right, let's go get it set up. Okay. Who's going at this how about that spot, Jason? Perfect. Dirt and everything. Good. Okay. Okay. Here, let me First hold that for you. Okay, I'll hook the alligator clips up. It's one. one. Two. There. The igniter in there, okay? Perfect. Okay. All right. There you go. Okay, I've got the key in now and the light's on. The light's on? Yeah. Okay, area clear all around? Nobody's here. Okay. Okay. Are you ready? Okay. Ten. Ten nine, nine. Eight. eight seven, six, six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Fire! 
Look at her go. Beautiful. That thing's spinning as it comes down. Congratulations. Beautiful launch, Jason. Tennis, have you ever bent glass? No, but I think that would be really neat. Well, to here's do that. some glass and we'll we'll bend it. But first I think you ought to find out something about the unusual properties of glass. Okay. First of all, what's a solid? A solid? Um well this glass is a solid. It keeps its shape, in other yeah, words. Yeah. It it can't it flow can't around flow all around, over the place. No. While a liquid? A liquid will um say if you dropped a, um, a drop of water on here it would it would move around. Yes, if you put it, it into a glass. It wouldn't stay in one place. Yeah, it would, it would cover the bottom. Okay. Or else well, glass it. is really a liquid that's solid. See, scientifically, when they, they define a solid, it's usually made of crystalline material. Could be a combination of many crystals, but it's usually crystalline. Glass is not crystalline. It's what they call amorphous. means all sort of, all the same material, but all sort of mixed up, but not crystalline. So. When, Ooh. if you would melt uh, chocolate or other kinds of solid, there's usually a definite melting point at which it melts, you know, it changes. Oh, yeah. Ice is a good example. Mm -hmm. you, if you start warming up ice at zero Celsius, it turns yeah. to water, so yeah. it has a definite melting point. Glass, on the other hand, does not. As you heat it up, it gets softer and softer and softer because it's really a liquid that can't flow. Oh. Very unusual material. Let's uh, bend yeah. some. Okay. okay. Now notice when you have, here, you want to hold it in the end of the flame. Okay. Just like that. A good example of a solid is an ice cube. Yeah. All right? And a good example of a liquid is water. And mm -hmm. you notice that ice has a definite melting point. Yeah. Right? At zero, mm -hmm. if you add zero. any more heat, it'll start to melt. Yeah. Well, glass is not like that. It does not have a de definite melting point. In fact, it gets softer and softer and softer as you heat it up. So try to hold it right like that. Okay. Now see the little orange part? Yeah. Okay, that means it's, it's beginning to get hot. Okay. So just hold it right there, and when you when you see the tip of it bend, then you know that it's it's a liquid that's getting softer and softer yeah, and softer. Yeah, it's, it's starting to melt. Yeah. Hold it right there. I'll push on it a little bit. Yeah, it's beginning to bend See how it's now. beginning to bend? Yeah. Okay, keep holding it in there because we'll get it soft enough so that I can reach in there with the pliers and I'll pull on it. You hold the other end. Okay. Ready? Keep pulling. Now it's really getting. Here it stretching. goes. It's really stretching now. Hold that now. I'm going to turn out the torch. See what we did? We made a very, very fine, thin thread of solid glass because glass is really a liquid in solid form. Have you ever heard a sound like this before? Yes, I have. Yeah. That sounds like a spoon vibrating, because I have it hung on the end of a string, right? Okay. And now I have the other end of the string. First I was holding it with my fingers. Now I have the other end of the string through a hole in the bottom of this plastic glass. See? There's a knot on the other yeah. end. Now I'll wrap it again. Listen. It was louder than before. Yeah, why? Well, because you're... Fingers were blocking the vibrations mm -hmm. of the string, and it wasn't letting the vibrations just sp spread out, so it would make a louder noise. Well, that's partly true, but now the vibrations are going all the way up here to the to the bottom of the plastic glass and making the whole glass vibrate. So it's considerably louder. What do you suppose would happen if you took this ear and stuck it right there in the glass? Listen. It's very loud. Yeah, try it again. Okay. Almost hurt your ears, it's so loud? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, 
the basis of vibrating the bottom of sort of a container like this is uh, the principle behind probably one of the most famous of all amateur scientist uh, experiments, the tin can telephone. You've made one of those, haven't you? Yes, sir. Yeah. You tie a string between two tin cans and talk to people. Well, this is my modern inversion made of plastic. And it works better than the tin can because the plastic can vibrate a lot easier. And you know how to do it. Tie a knot in one end of the string, put a hole in the bottom of the thing, usually with a hot nail or something like that, carefully now because you don't want to burn yourself. Yeah. And then you run the string and do the same thing at the other end. And you know how to talk uh, on radio phones when, you, when only one person can talk at a time? Yeah. One, you say over and out mm -hmm. and things like that. All right, let's try it. Because over here, see over there is the glass. Yeah. Take it and go way over to the other side of the room. And I'll go way over on this side. Out the door even. Now you gotta hold the string nice and tight and, and back up just a little more, okay? And hold the glass like, can you hear me now? Okay, let me talk first. One, two, three, four, five. What did I say? Over. One, two, three, four, five. What did I say? Over. Okay, uh, if uh, you, anybody you'd like to call over? Yeah, I would like to call Donnie Chow over. Okay, if you had him on the other end, what would you say? Over. Please call it. Hang up and please ring again. You've got the wrong number. <laughs> You're a great tease. Over and out. You're going to be the engineer of a 100-car freight train that weighs more than 1,700 tons. Now, you could learn by riding along with an experienced engineer until he felt you were ready to take the throttle. Or you could learn by driving Southern Pacific's engine number 8799. With you at the throttle and an instructor watching, you start out and go 100 miles or so. Even if you made every mistake possible, there's no danger to you, the instructor, or anyone else because engine 8799 doesn't travel 100 miles or even one foot. In fact, it isn't a train at all, but a giant model train, a simulator that works exactly like a real one to train engineers. Look out the front window. You see a widescreen color motion picture taken along the actual tracks. Look out the side window. You see the roadbed flashing by. Like a real train, the cab itself rocks and sways activated by special hydraulic machinery. All the controls and instruments work the way they would if they were in a real locomotive. When you push the throttle, a computer is programmed to reproduce the look, sound, and feel of an engine pulling 100 freight cars. The instructor can also program emergencies. This student has just lost air pressure, so he can't apply the brakes. The engine simulator built by McDonnell Douglas is less expensive than the real thing and speeds up the training of engineers. Even if you don't become a railroad engineer, it's likely that at some time in your life you'll learn to do a complicated job by practicing in a realistic computerized training simulator like engine number 8799. <laughs> Stacy, here's a quick little puzzle for you. I want you to pick up the rope on the desk with okay. one end in each hand. Okay? Yeah. Now tie a knot in the middle of the rope. Uh, 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 you let go. You let go. You can't let go. Okay. The beginning of a knot, but when you go to put it in the center of the rope, watch what happens. Oh, it's not anymore. Now, this sort of little puzzle is based on uh, the principle of many puzzles, which is to follow instructions carefully, but they base the puzzle on the fact that you do something in everyday life sort of in one way. Right. If you were going to tie a knot in a rope, what would you do? Well, I'd pick up both ends. Yeah, and then, and then, and then you'd let go on it and do it like that. Right. But the rules say that you can't let go. So if you have the rope sitting like that, remember my instructions were, I said, pick up the rope, end in each hand, but I didn't say anything about the fact that you could tie a knot in your arms before you picked it up. I don't understand. Fold your arms. Oh, I see now. So if I went like this. There you are. There's the knot.
Tennis, you've rubbed a balloon and stuck it to things, right? And it's yeah. clings, yeah, like that. Mm -hmm. What makes it stick like that? Static electricity. And what does that mean, static electricity? Well, it means that um, something is being um, drawn toward an object that has static electricity on it. Yes, but that is not what the word static electricity means. Oh. Static mm -hmm. means uh, stationary, can't move. And when you rub a balloon, on, especially on wool or fur, but paper also works, mm -hmm. you actually are rubbing electrons from the paper onto the balloon. And because oh. the balloon is a non-conductor, the electrons stay right where you put them instead of flowing all around. So that's why it's called static electricity. Oh, okay. And when you rub the electrons on and then you push it against something like that, they attract, they push electrons away from your face. Oh. And that's why it sticks. Yeah, I can sort of feel it. You can it feel on it a little face. bit. Yeah. yeah. Now, if you rub it real good, you can see, see where the static charge is by holding it over this stuff right here, which is unflavored gelatin. Watch. I'll get it all around here like this. See, that's where oh, the static yeah. charge is. See how it'll fly off every mm -hmm. once in a while too? Yeah. Yeah. That's because they pick up an, uh, uh, electrons and then are repelled. Oh. Now, if <clears throat> once you got the the uh, gelatin here. You can rub the balloon real good and hold it down over the gelatin and you'll see little stalagmites and stalactites. You know what they are? No. Well, in caves, you know, where the long things hang down? Oh, yeah. yeah well, that's the sort of thing you can do with, with gel unflavored gelatin. And the static charge on a balloon. Jason, we've looked at uh, a lot of different parts of a computer, but we haven't really yeah. talked about a printer. And a printer is oh. a very important part of it. Yeah. In fact, the computer goes so fast that sort of the typewriters won't work anymore. Remember how a typewriter worked? Yeah. Push, push, push a key for a letter. Then up came a, a, you know, a hammer and yeah. found it on the paper, and then it came back again. You had to push another one. Well, today, they've got better typewriters than that. They have a ball, for yeah. example, that spins around. But today, there are sort of, well, two basic types of uh, computer printers. One of them uses a variation of a, called a daisy wheel. Oh, and here yeah. you can see why it's called a daisy wheel. Doesn't that look like a little daisy? Yeah. Okay. And around the outside are little fingers, little petals of the daisy. And on the end of each one of those is a letter. Oh. So that this can spin back and forth very quickly. And then when it gets in the right position, a hammer comes from behind and pokes it. And so that would hit the paper and that, make the letter. Right. So now you have much less moving parts and it can go at fairly high speed. So that's mm -hmm. one kind that makes sort of what they call letter quality, using mm -hmm. a daisy wheel yeah. of some kind. Then the other one is called dot matrix. And mm -hmm. here I have a matrix. There's five spaces in this direction, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in that direction. Yeah. And I have formed the letter A with these yeah. little red balls. Now, the little red balls stand for wires. So when the computer sends a signal, it says, push this wire, that wire, this wire, this wire, this wire, this wire, this wire, to print the yeah. letter A. Okay, now we want the letter B, so you rearrange the little wires. Well. Here are more wires over here if you need them. Okay. There. Okay, now you'd poke that series of wires. And this means that the computer can go very, very quickly because it sends a signal up to the print head yeah. to print each one of those wires in whatever form that, that it's called for for the character. Now, in fact, I've got it all set up. Come on over here and take a look okay. at this. You hold that switch down right there. All right. And I can turn on the printer, and it's now going to print every one of the wire combinations that's in the printer. Okay, I'm holding you, it down. Okay, now let go. Here they come. Wow. Some of them aren't letters. No, they have all kinds of graphic symbols, too. Yeah. Notice it's printing in both directions, too. Yeah. Backwards and forwards. Backwards and forwards. So that's how you gain uh, a lot more speed by using printers that are designed specifically to work with computers. Hey, you're getting pretty good at that, Stacy. Yes. What makes the marble go around? Well, there's a little dip in the paper plate at the edge, and then the marble's forced to that, and then I just give it a little push and it starts. And it starts around, okay. 
Using the same kind of paper plate, here's a little puzzle for you. Okay. I'm going to do the same thing. Give the marble a push like this so it's going around the edge of the plate. What will happen when the marble comes to where there is no more plate? Will it go off like that? Will it go straight like that? Or will it continue to curve like that? I think it will curve, but not go back onto the paper plate. Why do you think that? Well, because the paper plate is, is curved right here. Mm -hmm. So it should Should curve. have some curve? Yeah. Okay. You watch what happens to it. Okay. Went straight. How come? Whoops, I gave it a little too much of a bump and bumped the side. Yes, it went straight. But it curved just a little bit. Well, not really. It's supposed to go absolutely oh. straight. Have you ever heard of the, the, the rule that when something is traveling, it will continue to travel in a straight line unless some kind of force moves it out of the straight line? No, I haven't. Okay, well, that's a, a standard physical law for anything that's in motion. Why does the marble curve? You told me that before. Because the edge of the plate was pushing right. it, right? Okay, when you don't have the edge of the plate to push it anymore... And there's nothing to make it curve. Nothing to make it curve, so it's going to go straight. Oh. Now, that same idea we're going to try with with this. Okay. See, here's a piece of pipe. Yeah. And on the string on the other end, there's a spool. Here, you hold that. All right. If you, if you drop it down, it's much heavier, right? Yes. Yet you and I are going to work it out so that that spool will support this great big weight. How? Based, based on that same idea. All we need is a pair of scissors and come on outside. Let's go. I'll give you. I'll show you how it works. Okay. Okay, Stacy. That ought to be good enough. Okay. Now you're right-handed, right? Yep. Okay. Here, take this in your right hand. And hold this weight in your left hand. Okay. Okay, now see if you can get the spool spinning above your head in a horizontal circle and then let go of the weight. Okay. Okay. Now there. Go. What's happening? Well, just a minute. Um, the weight, the, the spool is keeping the weight up. Yes, in spite of the fact, remember we said the spool is, is not nearly as heavy no, as, the, it isn't. as the weight. Now, how did that compare to the marble? Where's the marble? The spool's the marble. Right. And where's the plate? The string's the plate? Yes, the string is the plate. Now, remember when we cut the plate off? Yeah, it, the marble went in a straight line. The marble line. went in a straight line. Well, this time, this is no longer going to be the marble. This is going to be a satellite. Okay. And what's going to hold the satellite into orbit? The, the gravity. Gravity, which is represented by the string, right? Right. Actually, this weight, gravity pulling down on it. Oh, okay. okay. Now, uh, in a real satellite, if you want to launch it and get it to go outer space, you give it enough force to get out of the force of gravity. In this case, we can cut the force of gravity right there, can't we? With the scissors in your back pocket? Right, take the scissors out. Okay. I can see why you didn't want to do this in the house. Yes, it could fly around and break a window. Yeah. Are you ready to get rid of the force of gravity? Yeah. What's going to happen to the spool? I don't know where it's going to go, but it's going to go in a straight line. Right, <laughs> okay, cut it. Over there. 